so far in class, we've worked with, uh, we've done a lot of math, we've done a lot of calculating of matrices and such, um, but we've left out one component that you often see in um, quantum informatics literature as soon as you kind of get into more advanced topics. We've discussed phase, but um, now we're going to start introducing complex numbers in um, quantum computing and how they play a part and how they're important to calculations um, later on in more complex algorithms. So uh, this is simply just going to be building on the whole concept of phase. Um, so first we're going to just start by introducing what an imaginary number is and then uh, basic mathematics and then move into how they're important to quantum computing. All right, so quantum interference. Uh, we talked about phase and we talked about how when qubits are in superposition, they act um, constructively and destructively to interfere and cause um, changes in their in the data that they store. So these phase differences allow them to interact in such a manner. Um, so we call the difference in phase between ket zero and ket one. Uh, we call that, and we learn that as our computational basis. So we want to call the difference in phase. So perhaps that negative sign when we used the um, the Z gate or the um, superposition with phase. This negative sign would be our relative phase between uh, our basis cat zero and cat one. So this is uh, some, a term that you'll see frequently. So we want to remember that this relative phase is just the, the phase difference. So a difference in sign uh, between uh, cat zero and cat one. So how can we think about this? How do we think of how this works to cause uh, information to be processed in a quantum sense? We can think about waves and how when we have like signs and amplitude, we create a bigger combined wave. And we, when we have different signs and amplitude, so perhaps a plus and a minus, uh, when you try to combine those two, you'll, you'll have an amplitude that gets closer to zero. So we have two... Uh, uh, waves that have a like sign, we'll combine them together to make a bigger wave. Uh, so this would be an example of constructive interference. And then we have destructive interference. We have two waves of opposite signs. So we'd have maybe a positive sign, a negative sign. Um, and then we add those together, we get closer and closer to zero. So those two uh, interact and kind of cancel each other out in a sense. So probability amplitudes, we've looked at those. We thought about how a probability amplitude, not to be confused with probability associated with observing a state, but the probability amplitude is the coefficient that sits by a basis state. And you use it to calculate your probability that you're going to observe one state over another. Um, but it, it, it doesn't quite necessarily, it, it's, it's different from the probability. Um, but we've looked at probability amplitudes in quantum state uh, that are real numbers. So here we have our qubit state. We would have alpha and beta values that were equal to real numbers. So what is a real number? Well, a real number could be a integer. It could be a positive number. It could be a negative number. It could be a rational number. So example, 5.378, or it could be an irrational number, which would be square root of two and pi. So just as a little refresher, an irrational number is simply a number that like kind of goes on without any sort of truncation. Uh, you can't um, express it any way where it repeats. It just goes on infinitely. Um, and uh, But it is a real value. So it, these are all examples of real numbers. So once again, we have negative numbers. Uh, this negative number is also an integer. Um, so here we have a rational set of rational numbers and then irrational numbers. So we've looked at quantum states that include real numbers as probability amplitude. And we've looked at phase differences that um, occur between cat zero and cat one when we had an opposite sign. So since we were working with positive, or since we were working with real numbers, our phase difference would always be a, a negative sign, um, which is one you'd commonly see in, in quantum in, in computing. So common in fact that we have the phase flip gate, the Z gate. Um, so we, we saw how we would have these probability amplitudes and phase differences, but now we're going to start considering the case where our probability amplitudes uh, also have complex portions to them. So these complex numbers uh, have two parts, which we'll see in a second. Um, and if we, we look at what, um, 
mathematically. So this is just kind of an, an aside that's helpful. Uh, in a lot of con uh, quantum computing literature, you'll see these different symbols. So if you see this script R, that essentially sets the set of real numbers. So uh, what we talked about here with positive, negative values, rational, irrational. And then we see this fancy C, the script C, and that means a set of complex numbers. So previously we were working with real numbers and now we're going to introduce the possibility that we have complex values that can be associated with our um, probability amplitudes in our quantum state. So what is a complex number? A complex number includes a real and imaginary component. So we're not done working with um, real numbers. Uh, we now just are adding an additional number that we have to start thinking about. So if we have a complex number Z, we're going to express it in the following way, A plus BI. So we have a real part that's part of this complex value and then an imaginary part as well. So a helpful tool is to think of an XY plane. And you'll often see this uh, when you're working with the unit circle in trigonometry, uh, where you'll have the real plane on the x-axis and the imaginary plane on the y-axis, and you can express a complex number as a point in that imaginary and real plane. So whenever we are looking at an imaginary number, we have this new symbol here, i. Well, what does i mean? So i is the imaginary part of a value where we have i equal to square root of negative 1. Uh, so i squared is equal to negative one. So is everyone following so far? It seems a little, a little crazy, but you'll see very quickly how um, this i value kind of helps us out whenever we're trying to compute complicated things like quantum state. So working with complex numbers, we want to think about kind of like when we're working with an um, algebraic expression, uh, we want to combine the like terms for addition and subtraction. So if we had uh, 3 plus 4i plus 6 minus 2i, we would simply take the like terms so the real portions and the imaginary portions and combine them. So let's try that out. So 3 plus 6, that would be 9. 4 plus negative 2, well, that would be uh, positive 2. Um, so same here. So here, this is interesting because we have kind of this mixed expression in the sense that we have a real number that we're combining with a imaginary number. Well, that doesn't stop us. We can still go ahead and combine these terms. So we just simply apply the same procedure of combining those like terms. And since we don't have a complex value or an imaginary value associated with this first term, uh, we just go ahead and um, add, we just append that this negative i to the resulting sum of four minus three. So we get one plus i in this case. All right, multiplication. Multiplication is a little bit trickier. So we're going to return to our uh, tried and true FOIL method for combining two um, complex values through the process of multiplication. So here we'll have uh, three minus two i, and we're going to multiply that uh, by 1 plus 3i. So first, we're going to multiply the first term. So 3 times 1, that's going to be 3 outside. So 3 multiplied by 3i. Um, well, just like uh, if you were working with um, variables in algebra, if you're multiplying a constant by um, a term that has a um, a, co or a term that has a, a variable associated with it, we keep that variable. So 3 times 3 would be 9. We're going to append that i value now. So 9, um, now we have 9i inside. So negative 2i times 1, that's going to be equal to negative 2i. And then last, so negative 2i um, times 3i. So here's a tricky situation. When we start multiplying i's, we have to keep track of how many i's we're multiplying together because we're going to get a slightly different result depending on how many i's we're including. So we know that i times i, so i squared, is equal to negative 1 since um, i is equal to the square root of negative 1. So in this case, we have uh, our, our coefficients we're multiplying together, so that gives us a negative 6. We have i squared, which we know is equal to uh, negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 6, that gives us a positive 6. Finally, we want to go ahead and, so here we've got that note right here, um, that whenever we multiply i together, that's going to be equal to negative 1. And of course, we have negative 1 times negative 1, that gives us a positive 1. 
All right, so here we're going to go ahead and take all these terms. So after you FOIL, you're going to have to combine your terms. So now we have uh, done all our multiplication. We are back to an addition problem. So we have to take all these terms and we have to combine those like terms. So now we have um, the result of our multiplication equal to nine plus seven I. So complex values, how do they apply to quantum computing? Well, we have um, the Bloch sphere, which we talked about last time, and that's a way that we can visually represent a qubit. And so a qubit state, a valid qubit state can be any point on this Bloch sphere. Well, we are very familiar with working um, around this point where we go from cat zero to uh, cat plus, cat one, cat minus, but what if we start shifting around that Z axis? So we, we kind of stayed in the um, Z X plane, but let's start rotating around that Z axis and see what happens. So if we have the case where phi um, is not equal to zero or not equal to pi, so phi is associated with the rotation around Z, we end up getting complex value probability amplitudes. So um, on the Bloch sphere, we've learned how uh, cat zero and cat one are on the z-axis, cat plus, cat minus, which are our superposition states that we can generate with the Hadamard operation. Those are on the x-axis. And now we have these new states that we're going to introduce. Um, we're not gonna get too crazy with our complex states quite yet. We'll try to stay with the states that, are, um, that give us a, a, a maximal superposition. So here we're going to introduce the ket i state, which is going to lie on the y axis um, here, and it's going to be on the in the positive direction. So it's going to be a ket zero plus i ket one. So it looks like the following in our vector notation. So now we have a phase associated with um, with our um, our quantum state of i. So um, it, it looks a little, little, little crazy, but the thing is, it's, it's not much different from the complex, or it's not much different from the phase states that we looked at before. Um, because if we think about, um, we had our cat minus state, which was our superposition with phase state, uh, where we had um, cat zero minus cat one. Um, well, I is the square root of negative one. So it's just a, a, a part of a, um, of a phase rotation. So, so it's very similar because I is, is um, a factor of negative one. So now we have our um, other state, state that we're going to introduce on the Y axis. So here we have um, negative I, so ket negative I, which is going to be one over square root of two, ket zero, a minus I cat one. So it looks like the following. So now we have um, three different basis states that are available to us whenever we are working with states on the Bloch sphere. So we have these rotations and phase, and we're going to introduce two new gates uh, that are commonly used in quantum computing that are used for um, slight rotations um, of phi on the Bloch sphere. So we have the S gate, which is um, going to be equal to the following. So we have one and then a uh, I portion. So this looks very similar to our Z gate, so our phase flip gate, except in this case, we have a square root of one rather than a one. So um, very, very similar. We also have the T gate. So the T gate is going to be, um, this is a little bit more complex. Um, not just saying it because we're working with complex numbers, but we have an E portion in here too. And what is this E portion? So this is a mathematical constant known as Euler's number. And it's also uh, the base of natural log that is, um, but what we, we have this, this Euler identity that is a way for us to, to relate sine and cosine. So um, although this, this might look a little intimidating, um, what it is, is just a way to, to uh, represent a fraction of um, this I value. So um, I is actually equal to E I um, pi over two. So this is just a fraction of a um, I value, just like I is a, a factor of the square root of one. So we won't worry too, too much about those details. But we'll just look at some, some properties about the S and T gates. 
So we have these set of operations now that are um, known as the phase gates. So phase is so important to quantum computing because of that constructive and destructive interference that we have a variety of different phase gates available to us so we can tune the phase associated with our quantum state. Um, so S and T are multiples of Z. Um, so we can look at this and we can see that Z is, uh, or S is equal to um, one zero zero I, which is equal to the square root of Z. So what does that mean exactly? If we have S squared, we can see that uh, that'll give us the Z gate. So if we do our row times column, so we have one, one, zero, one, one, and um, we, we continue our multiplication. And for this final element, if we do our row times column, so we have zero, zero, I times I, well, we know that I squared is equal to negative one. So we can see that uh, if we have S squared, that is equal to a Z gate. Physically, that means if we pass a qubit state through two S gates, that gives us a Z gate. Relations between, so we're going to now look at a uh, relation involving the T gate. So we have the T gate, which um, has this representation of um, I pi over four. So that is equal to square root of S. So that is a fourth root of Z. So we have this S gate that is a factor of Z and then a T gate that is a factor of S. So what does that mean to us? So if we took T squared and we went ahead and did this matrix multiplication, we would see that although this term looks a little scary, if you multiply, uh, if, you, if you take E I um, pi over four and squared it, that would be equal to I. So this is just a, a um, factor of I. Um, and we're working towards generating that full negative one value, which is our Z gate. So if we have two T gates back to back, this equals the S gate. And then if we have four T gates, that is equal to the Z gate. So phase is so important to quantum computing that we have these, these gates that, um, we will, that we use so we can, we can tune that phase of our state smaller and smaller and smaller. So let's look at state transformation with S. So we have ket zero, and we're going to um, have that be transformed by the S gate. So here we're going to have our ket zero uh, represented as a vector, um, and we'll multiply it by the matrix of our S gate, and then uh, that is going to be equal to ket zero. So now we have ket one. So we have ket one, and we multiply that by our S gate, and that gives us a, uh, a ket one with a I phase associated with it. So now we are starting to generate these states that have complex phase or complex probability amplitudes associated with them. So why are complex values used in quantum computing? We have these signals that have to interfere and we have phase and we want our phase to be more than just positive and negative. So we wanna have um, a little bit more granularity there. So we would wanna have um, bigger phase differences and smaller phase dif differences. And in order to, to create this phase while in superposition, um, we want to have a way to, to tune that phase factor. So of course, while we're in superposition, the value of quantum state is unknown. And um, complex values happen to describe unknown values very, very well, especially those that oscillate. So in a way, you can kind of think about a quantum state that is in superposition as an oscillation it, because it's both. It's going between cat zero and cat one uh, with some probability of like more, being more likely one or the other, or maybe it's an even superposition of both. Um, so it's kind of oscillating back and forth between the two, and then you decide that value upon measurement. So it's both until measurement. Physical meaning is not really con connected to complex quantities. Um, but we can operate on these, these values and produce real numbers. So for example, you can take the absolute magnitude squared of a complex value and get a very real number. Our phase associated with probability amplitudes, we don't measure it, but it's still important for computation. And at the end of the day, it's still important that we have that requirement um, that when we have alpha and beta associated with cat zero and cat one respectively, the magnitude squared of those values is going to be equal to one.